Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to this installment of AMC Mailbag, the show where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad you decided to join us today on this Sunday. So glad that uh, a part of your weekend, and you want to spend it with us. Who knew? Uh, listen, joining me, I'm not alone today. Sitting right beside me over here, he's the one, the only, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, how you doing? Hey, what's going on? Sunday, Sunday, here we <laughs> are hanging out with you. What's going on? Hey, hey listen, on? listen, by the way, you can get your question. If you have a question you'd like to, for us to have on the show you can look at just below me here and you'll see the email address amc movie talk at gmail.com you can send in your question maybe you'll get picked sometime to be on amc uh, movie talk monday through friday or maybe we'll might get to it here on amc mailbag so without any further ado let's dive right into it let's get to question number one and the question number one today comes to us from eric brooms who writes i am a big fan of you guys thanks so much eric I watched your show every single day. You were talking about Cyclops, and I was wondering if they didn't show Cyclops dying because they would use him for other films, like X-Men Apocalypse, which is, if you read the comic, was on the side of Apocalypse. For those of you who don't know what he's talking about, in Age of Apocalypse, Cyclops is actually on Apocalypse's army. He's, a, in, he's not a villain per se, but he's on the villain side. Anyway. Could we see something like that as an end credit teaser for Days of Future Past? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. Well, uh, it's a very good question, Eric, and I, we kind of brought this up on AMC Movie Talk the other day, and I'll just kind of rehash what I said there. I have never believed that Cyclops was dead, ever. It, right from X-Men 3, I mean, the death of characters in X-Men or any comic, book char- any comic book film is dubious to say the least. Right. But I have never believed that Cyclops was actually dead. Why? Because they never show us him dying. In in, Everybody else that Phoenix kills in that movie, we see her disintegrating them. But with Scott, a.k.a. Cyclops, we just see the wind start to blow and it cuts away to some other scene. And then later, Wolverine and Storm find his glasses on the beach. And we assume that Phoenix killed him. But that make, doesn't make any sense. Phoenix didn't just go around killing people willy-nilly for no reason. Right. Phoenix had no beef with Cyclops at the time. And there just didn't make any sense. I believe he is alive. And I do believe, I have nothing to base this on. I, I sent Amy Rose to cover the junket in New York. So Amy Rose has seen X-Men Days of Future Past. But I will, She's so lucky. She's so lucky. Uh-huh. And I will forbid her from telling me this. Uh-huh. I would not be surprised at all if he does pop up either post credits or at some point in the film. I won't. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. I think we'll see him back, and I would love to see James Marsden. I just want them to do Cyclops right because, as much as I love X Men One and, and X Men Two, and I love those characters, the biggest weakness of those films is the way they treated the Cyclops character. They totally neutered the Cyclops character, yeah. and that's been frustrating to me. So I would love to see them bring him back and redeem what they have done with this amazing character. Anyway, Schnepp, what do you think? Well, I mean, uh. We've read that James Marsden and uh, Brian Singer have been pals, they've been friends. That's one of the reasons uh, James Marsden, you know, dropped out of X-Men 3 early to go beyond Superman Returns. He was like, you know, sort of like uh, they're pals. So my guess is I agree with you. I hope that they were able to get him at least for uh, an end credit sequence for however the future unfolds. We all know Wolverine goes into the past. We've seen that from the trailer. Some stuff is going to happen. Some things are going to change. I think it's a kind of an interesting guess to just say that they're going to come back to the future and things are going to be different. Back in time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think the the chance to, to reboot the X-Men completely and give us a brand new world, it's there in the end of X-Men Days of Future Past. And them announcing the next film is called X-Men Apocalypse is giving us all like a okay that we can kind of guess something big is going to happen when Wolverine shows back up. Right, right. And, you know, we're all talking about Hugh Jackman. Uh, the Wolverine's going to be his last movie. No, X-Men Apocalypse is yeah, going to be Hugh his Jackman last movie. Hugh Jackman signed on for X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah, so, so he's got two left. Well, and that's coming before another X. Like, they're talking about another Wolverine film after that, which I, I think he'll, I, you know, a Wolverine 3, as it were. Right. Uh, and I think he will do that, and I think that'll probably be it, but... 
Yeah, I mean, we'll that would, I, I'd be cool with that. I mean, not like I have a choice to be cool with it, whatever. Like, <laughs> I'd be cool with you, Jackman, finally deciding to Fox retire. Fox gives you up a call. Hey, would you be okay if we moved on? Fox, I think so. As long <laughs> as Hugh Jackman agrees to do X-Men Apocalypse and Wolverine 3. See, I bet you didn't know that's how this all happened. Yep. That's how it all happened. That's the power <laughs> of the web. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next question today. The next question today comes to us from a gentleman by the name of Rob Lund, who writes, Do you think the opening weekend box office of X-Men Days of Future Past will be affected negatively by the Brian Singer controversy? I myself tend to think no, as he's a director, not a star in the film. Also, do you think a strong second weekend for Godzilla could prevent it from reaching the $125 million opening weekend number that the studio is expecting um well it's an interesting question number one with the brian singer thing i don't think it'll affect the box office very much for for a couple of reasons number one for the one that you mentioned he's not it's not his face on screen so it's not going to be staring at people uh the controversy if you will will not be staring at people in the face um as the movie's going on as the movie's happening so so that's the one thing the second thing is this This isn't like the Chris Brown situation where, no, we know Chris Brown, uh, you know, the, the, you know, pseudo man um, decided it was really tough of him to haul off and beat the crap out of a woman to the point that she had to be hospitalized. That wasn't in question. That was a fact. And we all knew it. That was the fact. It was established. That was the fact and all that kind of stuff with Brian Singer at this point. The whole thing with about the Brian Singer and why I don't think it's going to affect box office much is these are just allegations right now. Now, I've gone on record. I've said this before. I'm a big fan of Brian Singer. I love a usual suspects is in my top 10 of all time. Uh, always has been since I've seen it. Uh, I really like Valkyrie a lot. I love X-Men 1 and X-Men 2. But if it turns out, if it comes to light that these allegations are true, then to hell with him. To hell with Brian Singer, but I, we live. In, I be, I choose to live in a society where we assume innocence until proven otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I've always been very suspicious of the fact that wait a minute, this this stuff supposedly happened 14 years ago, 12 years ago, 17 years ago, whatever, uh, and it's just coming up now, a few weeks before the release of the biggest movie maybe of the year and of his career. Right. It's, it smells fishy and suspicious to me. But once again, I'm not going to assume the worst of, of either party. Right. But because of those two things, because right now these are just allegations and anybody can be alleged, you know, can be accused of anything, because the fact that he's a director and he's off screen, and because I think, you know, most people in our society have, have grown accustomed to people being accused of crap. I think most people have are taking the approach of, well, let's see what actually happens. Let's not assume the worst. Let's not assume the best. Let's just see what happens. Because of all those things, I don't think this controversy is going to affect um, the box office of the film. I, I really don't. I don't think it's going to affect it at all. As far as a strong opening for Godzilla, will that affect the overall numbers? I don't know. I, I think Godzilla is going to do really, really well. And I think everybody who wants to go see X-Men are not going to not see X-Men because hey, every- Godzilla was out. Right. Um, so, so no, I don't think it's going to affect it. My, I could be wrong about that one, but I, I don't think it's going to affect it. Schnepp, how do you see it? Yeah, dealing with Godzilla first, I think anyone who wants to see Godzilla is going to be cramming the theaters to see it that opening weekend. And anyone who didn't get to see it that opening weekend will be seeing it the following yeah, weekend. Agreed, so agreed. they'll see it Friday or they'll see X-Men Friday and then they'll see Godzilla Saturday. They're going to make it their, you know... I. Godzilla is a very exciting film, and it looks like this reboot is done right. So yeah. I'm very excited to see it. I love the character. Loved him since I was a little kid. Didn't really dig the Roland Emmerich Godzilla. Haven't been that much of a fan of some of the, even the 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 Toho Studios Godzillas. Right, yeah. Just sorry, it's like because those were really kind of kid-based. So in order to get a modern adult feel to Godzilla, like it looks like I'm hoping that Gareth, Ed, uh, Gareth Edwards, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hoping he was able to secure this overall kind of a slightly more adult tone but yet you know to make godzilla what it should be The trailers look terrifying yeah it should be a film that's like for families should be able to go to it it shouldn't be an r-rated film godzilla is not an r-rated film 
but it should also, you know, it shouldn't be for little kids. So I'm looking forward to Godzilla cracking records because I want to see multiple Godzillas if this one is good. So I haven't seen it yet. But um, with the Brian Singer thing, yeah, guilty until proven innocent. And here's the thing. Yeah. Or the I, other way around. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> innocent until proven guilty. Sorry. Um, yeah. With Brian Singer, though, it's like, look, you're right. He's being attacked like 15, 16 years later after this happened. Yeah, it's and, kind and, of a it's a weird thing, and and we're not saying they're they're not true. We're not saying they're true. We're just saying, hey, look, on the surface, two things to keep in mind. And you and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Number one, we know that the exploitation of underage people in Hollywood is a real thing. Yeah, we know that's a real thing. Right. But we also know that that the accusations smell a little fishy for all the reasons you and I have talked about before. Yeah. So we're not we're not in a position. We're not saying it's definitely bogus or it's definitely true. We're saying we don't know. Right. The That's other thing it. is, I mean, Brian Singer's an openly gay yep. director. Makes him so, an easy target. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to put into into perspective. I think, you know, are, are people going to be going in with blinders like, no, I don't want to think about this. this. I love the X-Men. Maybe, maybe not. But I don't think it's, uh, you know, he's not a, a, a con he's he hasn't been convicted and he probably won't be either convicted or not convicted until it goes to trial. And remember, this is, these are not criminal charges. He's not facing criminal charges. This is a civil lawsuit. So he's not going to be convicted of anything. It's just a money grab. It's, it, right. It's, it's so. uh, well, it's a lawsuit is for financial compensation. Yeah. So. Yes. So it technically a money grab. So, <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it's slimy no matter what the outcome. So uh, let's all hope that it's not the, the yeah. horrible slimy. And, and I'll say once again, if it is true, to hell with him. Anyway, all right, let's move on to uh, the third question today. And the third question today comes to us from Nathaniel Scott, who writes, When a movie gets made, we know the studio has a production budget and an additional marketing budget. So why not remarket classic or modern great films, example, Star Wars, the original saga, Gladiator, The Godfather, using a regular production budget but having no production costs? There's already positive hype and word of mouth, and with a full-scale marketing campaign, surely the studio could make a lot of money and please the fans. I'd love to see some classics back on the big screen. I know this is done occasionally, but why not more often? Nathaniel, it's, it's a terrific question. Um, there are a couple things to keep in mind here. Number one, as you mentioned in the question, the studios do do this every mm -hmm. once in a while. I know AMC, we had a big run of, of uh, Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, last year, Jurassic Park was re-released in yeah. 3D, which was a new thing. Uh, and, and AMC right now has like a classics program where every once in a while these older classic films are replayed in the theater. Why it doesn't happen more often, though, I, and I'm just speculating here. This is just my thought. A couple reasons. Number one. Mo like 80, I read some statistic on Fandango one point, one time that it was like 89% of the people do not rewatch movies. Like once they see a movie, they've seen it, they don't rewatch it, even if they buy the DVD. And it is crazy. I've seen some crazy statistics about the number of DVDs that get purchased that never get viewed because generally people buy the DVD when they've already seen the movie. Uh, and a lot of people don't want to rewatch a film. With Star Wars or something like Jurassic Park in 3D, there's something different because now you're adding a new thing to it. With Jurassic Park was the anniversary. Seeing that, that's a big screen kind of film. Whereas The Godfather is not really, it's one of the greatest films of all time, but it's not really a film that you need to see on the big screen per se and go and sit for three hours to watch a movie you've already seen uh, a long time ago and probably have already seen 15 times. And they're not like adding new, there's nothing new being added to it. Um, so for those reasons, I think there are going to be, there is going to be the occasional film that it just makes sense to bring back to the big screen, either because of a new 3D conversion or just it's a big screen epic kind of feel. Mm -hmm. Like a Lord of the Rings, I think is, is ripe sure. for re-releasing in, in theater sometime. But you got to keep the expectations realistic as well. So I don't think we're going to see a big uptick and the, the number of films that get re-released in theater. I think every year there'll be one or two. And I don't see it getting much more beyond that because I don't think you can make money with them, really. Anyway, Schnapp, what do you think about all this? Well, I mean, it's interesting to think about, like, how just times change. I mean, the re-release of films used to be the lifeblood of cinema in certain senses. Yeah. They, would, they could re-release Star Wars or Jaws multiple times every year. Yep. Hey, you didn't see it because it wasn't out. Video didn't work exist yet. You didn't yeah. have videos and DVDs. Now everything is like streamable. You could just like, ah. And on top of that, we have technology now that like 
only 20 years ago, you couldn't have like a 45, a 55, a 65 inch giant plasma flat screen TV with like yeah. 7.1 stereo. It's like we have little mini home theaters now in our house. So hey, if I want to watch The Godfather, I'm going to rock that in my baby home theater, you know? Right. And yeah. it's going to have all the amenities of a, a giant theater. So what drives you to the theater now? Big blockbuster tentpole films something that you can't experience in your home theater i remember i read a really interesting article this is back like when uh this is back about two or three years ago but when the home theater thing was really starting to raise like people mm -hmm. getting now with these i've got a 60 inch over there and the thing great speakers and all that kind of crap mm -hmm. but this study came out that actually and, and a lot of people were speculating well now that people these tvs are getting so big people are going to stop going to the movies because of this really cool study came out that showed that people who own what they would classify as home theater systems, like a 50, a 60 inch TV, surround sound system, stuff like that, they are more likely to go to the movies. That The, the people who own the, the great mm -hmm. home theater systems are actually the people who go to the movies more often than people who don't. But I agree with the point you're making because now, I'm obviously a movie guy, so I want to watch movies at home and great mm -hmm. stuff like that. But that also means I want to go to the theater when the movies first come out. Right. But now when the movies come out on home video, I don't really feel the need to go back to the theater unless it's a Jurassic Park or a Star Wars right. or something. And here's the thing that, that the question is asking, but this exists in a lot of big cities, maybe smaller cities, not so much. But we have revival theaters. Like yeah, here, yeah, here yeah. we have Cinefamily, we have Beverly, the new Beverly, where every night there's a brand, uh, not a brand new, but an old film. There's at least two of them playing. I, I know in the Chica in Chicago there was the Music Box Theater mm -hmm. where you can go every night and see two different movies of a specific genre. Maybe it's film noir, maybe it's Ben Hur, all these different amazing films, and get that cinematic experience. Ben Hur is one I would go to and watch over. And that's over all again I'm saying is that there's yeah. films that are made to be seen cinematically, and the and that's the majority of the ones that we always talk about. Those are the ones that we love seeing either on the small screen or if they're going to play it again. If, if you ever never saw Alien in the theater, the oh, original yeah. Alien, that is a movie to experience in the theater, as is Aliens. So I think like, like two or three years ago, Ann and I went to go see um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. They, they were re-releasing right. in the theater and it's like, hell yeah, we're going to yeah. watch it on the big screen. So the, 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 there's films that are made to be seen in the theater and it's, it's great now. We live in a great time now where... The theatrical experience is coming to television. We're getting amazing quality programs like Game of Thrones. I'd, I'd say you can actually see Game of Thrones, the episodes themselves, in a theater. We were also having things like where you have the, all the extended versions of Lord of the Rings, which they weren't released theatrically, but now with the Lord of the Rings The Hobbit coming out, you can do like a the extended version, prepare to camp out in a theater and <laughs> stay here for 14 hours to see just the first three films. Like, I think the the fourth one is like four hours and 38 minutes. You know, so those are some long films. Stack those together. That's like an all day event, you know. Yeah. And let's not forget, too, like we talk about reviving these things, like when Captain America comes out, like at AMC theaters, we did a, a mini Captain America marathon where we showed Captain America one and Captain America two. When Avengers came out, we did like Iron Man one, Iron Man two, Thor and Captain America culminating with a very long day that started like eight in the morning right. with the first screening of Avengers, you know, and, and uh, I think with the next Hobbit film, we'll probably have all three Hobbit sure. films. I mean, so they're always really cool and special events like, you know, we just did um, on Friday, we did our spoilers review of Neighbors. Look, you got to take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt because I do work for AMC theaters, but you can go back to my movie blog days and you see I've been saying this and writing about this for years, long before I even heard of AMC. The, the way, if you are a movie fan, the way to see a movie is in a theater. Not just because the big screen, the big sound, but it's also the environment. Because we were talking, in, in our review of Neighbors, we were talking about there's nothing like being in a great comedy surrounded by 400 other people and you're all just laughing together yeah. and having that experience. It's just... The way, and I do love it when you get these great films that do have theatrical re-releases and do it. But it, once again, it's got to be the right film. Yeah. You know? So, and the great thing about theatrical re-releases is your when you go to that theater. Like I went and saw the original Batman, the 1989 Batman, oh. a re, like a, a special screening. It was at the Cinerama Dome, sold out. Oh yeah. And it was so much fun to see that movie, like I'd seen it multiple times, but to see it with a giant crowd who loved it and appreciated it, yep. it, it's a transformative experience. So it's like, it's one of those things like, yeah, when you see a comedy, 
and there's a whole bunch of people laughing and you're enjoying it. It's just it's a it's a it's a great experience. That's the theatrical experience. So, all right, let's move on to the next question today. I can't remember which number we're on. Uh, are we on this one? No, we just did that one. We are doing uh, question number four, which comes to us from Nick Verva. Verva. That's that, no, that, that sounds right. Yeah, I like Nick, the first Nick time. Verva. N- Nick Verva. <laughs> so Nick Verva writes, with Andy Serkis's Caesar having a major role in a, and a big speaking part in the upcoming Apes movie, will it be possible for him to finally get nominated for an Oscar? Okay. I, I want to be careful how I handle this, but I I was quite adamant that I believed Andy Serkis deserved a Best Supporting Actor nomination for his work as Caesar in Planet of the Apes because it was just phenomenal. What he did with the life he brought to that character was amazing. Now, you want to resist the temptation, though, just because somebody gives a great performance to say, deserves an Oscar nomination. No, 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 no. Step back and see, are there five other people who give better performances? Deserved an Oscar nomination can only be uh, something you can decide by comparing it to what else was done that mm, year. That's right. So it's far too soon. Even if Andy Serkis does a great job as Caesar, which I'm sure he will, in the new Planet of the Apes movie, you can't just run off and go, then he deserves an Oscar nomination. Not necessarily. Let's see all the other great performances that come out this year and measure them appropriately. Now, having said that, when I brought up the idea that I thought Andy Serkis deserved a nomination, some people who are against the idea will bring have brought up the argument to me, well, no, because it's not really his performance. There are digital artists who are making Caesar look the way mm-hmm. he does. There are digital artists who change little inflections, maybe in the eyes or the mouth and stuff like that. There are other people behind Andy Serkis's performance, mm-hmm. to which I say, I agree, there are. But guess what? When Daniel Day-Lewis is on screen as uh, President uh, Abraham Lincoln... There are other people behind that performance as well. There's the director directing him, telling him what he wants. There are the makeup people who make him look like this thing. There are the set designers that create the environment that he has to now interact with and all that kind of stuff. I agree. And Andy Serkis isn't the only guy bringing the the performance of Caesar to life. But no actor on screen is alone bringing their character to life. It is a team effort anyway. And I thought he brought a lot of life to that character. And for that year, I would have nominated him for a Best Supporting Actor nom. This year, let's see him first. And then let's wait to the end of the year to see what else comes out before we jump ahead of ourselves about Oscar nomination. Anyway, Schnapp, how do you see it? Well, you bring up a great point. Like, I'll differ with you on, I think that there should be Oscar nominations for mocap actors. But I think it should be this year's Oscar goes to for mocap acting. You would you would create, would create a category. A, I would create a category it. just like there's a lot of categories in the Oscars that don't exist yet. That's one of them that should exist. I think, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of categories. We won't go into that. But mocap for sure. I thought like uh, even like last year, The Life of Pi. Um, right. The DP one, which I thought was horrible, not because he didn't deserve it, but because the people he basically shot a green screen. That was what he did. Right. The almost 80 percent of that entire film was green screen. Did he actually composite or create any of those special effects or the, the, the tiger or any of those? No, he didn't. So it's sort of like that, that the special effects company. It was Rainmaker, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was a Rhythm and Hughes. Rhythm and Hughes. And That's then right, that they went yes, bankrupt yes, yes. literally that week yep. while and, winning the Oscar. And Ang Lee, didn't who I them. love. Yeah. I love Ang Lee. But when you know how much of that movie was Rhythm and Hughes. It's really disappointing that Ang Lee, thanking all the people that he thanked, yeah. didn't even mention Rhythm and Hughes. It's the insulting. company that went bankrupt, partially because yeah. of his movie, because went they bankrupt. put so much effort into something that won him an Oscar and, and he made them not much money. Yeah, to not even thank them was disappointing for a guy with the reputation of an Ang Lee. It was disappointing. Sure, I mean it's ego based and insulting yeah. on this on top of that. So I and and to to make it, you know, worse, I liked The Life of Pi. I thought it was a really it was he did oh, Ang, it's Lee, wonderful. Ang Lee did it's, a great job. He's an it's amazing like, director. He's yeah. great. I mean, aside from the Hulk, um, <laughs> and so, I even I liked what he did with the Hulk. But, but uh, weird Nick, Nick Nolte, like, Phantom uh, Nick Nolte, and weird and Hulk, the Hulk dogs, dogs. And stuff. It's <laughs> too much for me. But um yeah, there's parts of the Hulk that are fun, like him jumping around like a little flea. Bee, yeah. You know, me and my gal always joke about that. But 
Ang Lee, insulting Rhythm and Muse to me, especially coming from like I have a lot of friends from Rhythm and Muse who right, lost their right. jobs. So I was like, not they very lost their company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying it was a horrible thing that went down. So you got to remember that when you're also talking about Andy Circus and basically Caesar is a completely 3D manifestation. If you look at at Andy Circus, he is acting in a mocap suit with all these bubbles and balls around him. Then he is digitally erased, and everything that he is is captured, not only in a computer, but then there's artists adding things. Like you're saying, it's just so different. It's so different than what a makeup artist is applying to Daniel Day-Lewis, like the hair and the skin. Then you, But you're seeing Daniel Day-Lewis. It's captured. With Andy Circus, it's captured in such a different way that I personally don't feel that it should be comparatively right. like in the same category. Should it be a category? Should he have won something for Gollum? Yes. I think he's an incredible actor. He's just a good actor in general. If you haven't seen Burke and Hare, what an amazing film. It's on Netflix. Him and Simon Pegg, great film. He himself, just without mocap, is a great actor. He's awesome. I think, yeah. If this new Caesar, like the Dawn, the new Dawn trailer, right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, seeing that, I had my hair was. I was like, oh, I'm so excited. And I was like, I literally cannot wait to see that film. I, I, there may have been a little piddle in my pants with <laughs> war. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. so great. What yeah. a great trailer. Awesome so, trailer. Um, yeah, Andy Serkis. I, I hope that the, the Academy eventually resolves this issue. I think what has to happen though is because. Look at Avatar. That's going to be those. The, there's a bunch of movies that are Warcraft. All these yes. movies are coming along. I'm sure but there's going to be mocap with Star Wars. There's still the vast minority. And here, here's the the problem they face. But I, but I agree with you because I think we're going to get to that point. I still kind of feel that the best animated category is a cop out I, because you know you you give an Oscar for best cinematography. That cinematographer is in competition with. 800 other cinematographers right. to win that award. You're nominated for best animated film. You're up against 15 other films you know, or right. 20 other films right. or, or whatever. And it's not broken up into the same kind of categories. Yeah. And I kind of feel like right now we're still too early because to me, it's not a legit category. If you've got 20, 20 potential nominees, you've got to have a hundred potential nominees, something like that. But the way technology is evolving and the more and more mocap we're starting to see, I think we will get to the point where it's like, you know what? This year there were 45 mocap artists performing in different films. At that point, I feel then you go, okay, maybe it's time to start looking at creating a category for this as opposed to creating the Andy Circus Award <laughs> given out every year because Andy Circus is the only well, real guy if he, doing if it. If he rocks it this year, he should get it. He should get it as an honorary <laughs> award. That's right. All right, let's move on to, uh, I believe we're on question number five now. And question number five comes to us today from Austin Valdez, who writes, Hey, AMC, my question for you guys is, so we've heard that uh, we will be getting a Mrs. Doubtfire sequel. Yep. <laughs> and a Beverly Hills Cop 4. Yep. Those movies are coming. And we were all begging for those movies, right, guys? <laughs> I can't seem to get excited for these movies due to the long hiatus they have been on. For some reason, though, I wouldn't mind an Austin Powers 4. I think it would do better at the box office than any of these two movies. What do you guys think? Thanks, you guys rule. Well, thanks a lot so much for the question, Austin. And I'm going to agree with you 100%. I think you can absolutely do an Austin Powers 4. I want an Austin mm -hmm. Powers 4. Uh, 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 he's been talking about doing an Austin Powers 4 for about three years. I remember three years ago, I did a story on the fact that he came out and said he's writing the script for it. And then it just kind of fell off. He's directed a couple of uh, like documentaries. In in the meantime, he did that one movie that effectively killed his career. He did with the Love Guru. Yeah, that 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 essentially killed his career. That movie was Ooh. just wretchedly awful. But I'm telling you right now, you get him doing a new Austin Powers film. I never got tired one bit of the Austin Powers stuff. You put out another one now. I'm there. I think a lot of people would be there. I think it would be a success. You know, keep the budget under 100 million dollars for heaven's sakes. Um, but I, I think it would do great, and I really hope he returns to it. I, but I, I don't know. Maybe he's got no desire to go back to it, but I hope he does. What do you think? I, I think for sure that he would want to do it. Like, he's been taunting us for years that yeah. there is another Austin Powers coming, and it's just been long enough where it's like, you know what? You should go into production on Austin Powers 4 and 5. Just do both of them <laughs> at the same time. 
I agree with you. Keep it in a realistic budget. I mean, all, the, all of the Austin, Austin Powers films weren't like like hundred million dollar films. No, they were all, no, they were like all the reasonably 30, budgeted. 40, yeah. yeah, thirty or forty million. I mean, a budget where if you make one hundred and fifty at the at the worldwide box office, you've made money. Yeah, keep it in that price range, and you're good. I think it's great. It's a, and we all love that character. So yeah. I mean, I think it's a, a, a above and beyond Mrs. Doubtfire Part Two, which I. I don't like. I can't imagine that people are like, my, "Where's my Mrs. Doubtfire 2? I go to the video store all the time. I look and go to the local AMC. Excuse me, sir. Where's the lineup begin? For, yeah. I don't I'm going see that to be happen. sleeping out here. Doesn't it start in and about it might two be years? Awesome. The movie yeah. might be awesome. We're just saying there wasn't a lot of people, <laughs> you know, raising their fists in the air like we've been doing for Incredibles two for years right. and years. There hasn't been a big public outcry for where's our Mrs. Doubtfire right. two, but Mrs. it's coming. Mrs. Doubtfire was a fun film. I remember seeing it. I laughed a few yeah, times. Twenty years yeah, ago, yeah, but it's so old I can't barely remember it. I'm yeah. like Austin Powers. I can re- recite scenes from e- all three of the films, so I'd love to see an Austin Powers four. All right, let's move on to the last question today, as it turns out. And the last question today comes to us from Warren Hood, who writes, My question is about production budgets. I'd like to know, what are the biggest reasons certain film budgets are so high? Beyond the obvious, heavy CGI, talent salaries, locations, etc. One example might be White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen. $150 million budget versus $70 million budget. Is this attributed solely to Jamie Foxx and Channing Tatum's, uh, by quotes, I assume you mean salaries? I'm just curious how some movie budgets are so vastly different. Um, It's a great question, but you can't, in your question, you're just discounting heavy CGI locations and talent salaries. You can't answer this question without addressing heavy CGI, and not just CGI, even practical effects. Sometimes CGI is the cheaper option. Everybody just assumes CGI, that automatically means... Well, no, sometimes people do CGI because it's cheaper to do with CGI than building, yeah. you know, a whole certain type of or a set. traveling to a, all these different countries. Sometimes yes. they just shoot yep. a green screen and they, they buy location footage of like the exterior of London and then CG a shot of somebody walking in along the street. That's way cheaper than bringing an entire crew to London and shooting. Them. Yeah. Similar like France and any of these exteriors, even like television. Now, the seat, the special invisible effects are on television shows now where somebody like, all right, I'll see you at Frankie's and they, they go outside. That's not outside that you're watching. That's just somebody against a green screen. And then they composite that shot. And it's called, it's just an, what it is, an invisible effect. You, it just goes right by you. You see a, a spaceship flying, shooting lasers. Oh, I know that's not real. Yeah. But most of the effects that we see now just daily, we don't even think about as effects. Zodiac was a prime. Mm, that's an incredible that's one. A yeah. film that a lot of people do not realize. Wow. You are watching an awful lot of visual effects and you don't even know it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, so that's incredible. Tracking yeah. shots. Yeah. Just amazing effects. If you watch any of the behind the scenes on Zodiac, it'll blow your mind. I, like stuff that I didn't even know was like, I was like, yeah, that overhead shot's definitely CG. But then once we get to the street corners, I was like, what? Yeah. Why? You know? Uh, very heavy, heavy CG film. But you know, it, it, it comes down to a lot of different things it comes down to the style a director decides to shoot in can can cost or save a lot of money the what medium they shoot in film versus digital and if digital what kind of digital mm-hmm. are you shooting are you shooting it in 3d these things add a lot do you go to locations and think do you travel around like do you pull a james bond and actually shoot in turkey and istanbul and things like that or do you shoot on a sound stage here in burbank at warner brothers uh, how much visual effects and Look, I've seen movies, and you and I could both name probably 10 movies off the top of our heads that were like $3 million films, but their production budget was actually $35 million because the three lead actors you got each demanded 12 to $15 million per film. Right. Like you cannot underestimate the cost that goes into these things. For And let's, let's face it, Gerard Butler and Aaron Eckhart are not going to have the combined salaries of right now a Jamie Foxx and a Channing Tatum. Right. So you're probably looking at $30 million difference right there alone. Right. Um, and also remember, actors sometimes take, hey, just pay me salary, put all of the rest of the money into the film. So yeah. there's, I mean, you don't see that a lot, but some actors do. Like if they want, if they want to be in, involved in like a, a high quality film and that film is like, look, we're at 30. We love to have you. I know you're like a 20 or 15 or a 10 person. If you could rock it for like one, that we could take that 10 and put it back into the film. Yep. And then they like, hey, you know, we'll make a back end salary type thing. There's all kinds of ways like to Scarlett, whittle it. Scarlett Johansson has done that a number of times. She's sure. like taken much lower than her going rate. A lot of actors, just because they want to be, when they sometimes actors, when they see a film that they just really want to be a part of, 
they will take a much lower. Yeah, they want to work with a specific writer or a specific yeah. director. Yeah. They're like, look, it's not even about the money. I already have that. That part's settled. Like for Scarlett Johansson, she's like, I'm an I'm Black Widow in Avengers. Yeah. I think my I'm house is getting, paid off. I'm going to be getting big paychecks for the next yeah. five to ten years. And We're any good. of the other amazing films she's in, but the Under the Skin or it was called Under the Skin, right? Yeah. What a fantastic film! I was forgetting exactly. And I'm so film. looking forward to Lucy. That looks, and Lucy looks Lucy great. Lucy looks amazing. Yeah. But he did, she did her, mm-hmm. you know, for next to nothing, right. she did her. Now, we never see her on screen. Right. But still, I mean, there's just so many things that go into how much a movie, uh, how much a movie costs. I mean, just shooting on film as opposed to shooting digital is is a, a big difference. Yeah, and a really big difference. I, I mean, there's just a lot of different things. So studios that are smart can make really expensive films for a reasonable amount of money. And sometimes they just want to go, hey, we're sparing no expense in this. And there's right. some movies that are worth going, for this movie, we spare no expense. Right. And sometimes that's totally worth it, but not necessary. Right. All right, folks. Well, that'll do it for us here on this installment of AMC Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, there are a lot of really good films playing in AMC Theaters everywhere right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and your movie ticket information. Also, don't forget... Follow us if you haven't done so already. Get, click that thumbs up button on this video if you like it. Subscribe to our channel if you have not done so already. It's a lot of you already have, and we're very grateful for all of you. And you know, share this video on your Facebook page, Twitter, whatever. Help spread the word about uh, the AMC Movie News YouTube channel. I want to thank, first of all, and primarily, the guy sitting beside me. Thank you so much to Mr. John Schnepp for being here. John, where can people find you online? Oh, you guys can find me at Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And if you get a chance, go to schneppzone.com slash Superman Lives. Contribute to my documentary, The Death of Superman Lives. You can become a finishing funder, get your name in the end credits for a donation. So thanks, guys. And uh, you can find me on all the various social media channels, just uh, at John Campia. So thanks a lot for joining me, guys. This has been AMC Mailbag. So until next time, bye-bye.